be together here to learn of your word. Father, we lift up Danny right now to bring healing to whatever's causing that redness there. In the name of Jesus Christ, because by his stripes we are healed. And Father, we thank you for that. I thank you for my healing in my ear that I woke up with last night. I thank you for healing in my body and everyone here. Lord, you made these glorious bodies. And by those stripes were so that we could have a healthy physical body until you call us home. Father, we pray for Dave, for the blood vessel that's burst in his eye that you bring healing there. Amen. And Father, we just thank you and we praise you. We pray for everyone out there that's watching, whatever your prayer request, because you can't share them with us at the moment. But we stand with you in prayer and lift them up to the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's the one that is the answer. Amen. 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 All right, so we're going to look at, get your Bibles out and turn with me to 2 Thessalonians. Right after first lesson. You're so helpful. Or you give somebody the number, the page number in your Bible, but you know everybody's got different, different Bibles, different sizes. Okay. Ooh, that's a good coffee. Chocolate with us. If you want to send us uh, an offer, you go. We just twist your coffee. As an <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I'll set that. Um, let's just read chapter uh, 2, verses 1 through 3 together. Just follow along. Which chapter? Uh, two. Chapter 2, okay. verses 1 through 3, Second Thessalonians. Sorry. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you. That's a very strong admonition by any means. For that day shall not come. What is that day? It's the great day of the Lord. It's the day of the Lord. It's tribulation. Except there come a fallen away first, and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So, who cannot look just casually, casually at society, not see it just completely unraveling, politically, culturally, Faith and morality uh, 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 don't mean anything anymore. In other words, faith in Jesus Christ is, is seldom found. And morality, forget that. That's that's blase. That's past. And ethics. Um, I contend you can teach ethics in which they do in college. You can teach ethics all you want. But, all you want, but once you throw out the word of God, there is no ethics left. Was I turned on? Oh, sorry out there. I wasn't trying to mind. Anyways. Without God's word as the standard of truth, it doesn't matter what you te teach on ethics because it devolves into every man does what is right in his own sight. That's really what happens. And uh, so also, the question that we now have, of course, is this. Have we gone beyond the point of no return? I think so. Anyone else? I agree. Good point, too. Yeah. Good point too, yeah. mm -hmm. In this sense, we have not. We're still in the age of grace. But on this sense, we have. I don't see it getting better. In fact, I was talking to uh, someone not too long ago on the phone, one of our speakers uh, that will be here at this year's conference, our prophecy conference, if we're still here. Hopefully, we're rapturing and gone. I would love that. But that being said, as we were talking, and uh, we both agreed at the same time, we'll, we're beyond repair in this country. The divide is so great. You know why? Because one is based on truth. Not that all the Republicans are truthful and honest. Some of them are. In fact, most of them, if we really get right down to it, are in league with pushing one world government anyway. So they just do it slower. But there's no blending when you got at least some over here that there's that what they're espousing is based on some common sense of truth. And I believe common sense starts with and ends with Jesus Christ and the revelation of Scripture and all that. Because when you throw the Bible out, you throw common sense out. It makes no sense. I mean, they call, you know, a little baby can grow up uh, in time they're three or four or five to decide if they want to be a man or a woman. Common sense tells you that's impossible because a 19 or 20 year old doesn't even have that ability to decide that. And even then, it's contrary to the way God made us. He didn't make us uh, like earth ones where we're both. Male and female parts. No, we're 
Male and female. Rod and I were just talking about this, which I forgot that we were teaching on. And uh, I, somebody had put an article on Facebook, some 10 PhDs behind the name woman from Cambridge or something, saying that, um, you know, they did this big peer reviewed study saying that there is no scientific evidence to prove that adults having sex with children is harmful to the child. Mm -hmm. That's, that's just I mean, you couldn't even make that up, but that's where we're going. Yeah, I said that 20 years ago. 20 years ago, and people looked at me like I had crap falling out of my ear, thinking, oh, you're just being crazy. That's crazy talk, Brother Forrester. What are you talking about? But we're there. Mm -hmm. So, in one sense, we have gone beyond point of no return. I don't think there's ever coming back together. There can't be, because without truth, now you look. And what am I going to do that? You go back and let's, let's take our politics, for example. You go back 40 years ago when Reagan was elected. You had a Democratic-controlled Congress that worked with them and passed the majority of what he wanted. They did. It. Today, it's, they're not talking about impeaching Trump again or the coronavirus. It's just insanity. So that being said, we have gone beyond that. But men can still repent and come to their senses if they so desire so, no man can answer this question, have we gone upon, upon the point of no return, um, definitively one way or the other. Only God knows the answer to that. In other words, when you step over that line, and now judgment comes. But for believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a prophecy that is at the top of the list, one of, the top, one of those that are at the top, that lets us know how close we are. And prior to the tribulation, a falling away must be come first. Now as we go through this tonight, we'll see that there's a definitive uh, thing that's, that marks the falling away. Now, Paul also wrote to Timothy, remember, uh, I can't remember if it's in 1 Timothy 4.1 or uh, 2 Timothy, I think it's 1 Timothy, where he said, in the last days, perilous times, that means raging, uh, savage, insane times will come, and some will depart from the faith. Now keep in mind, Paul in both the Thessalonian epistle and in the uh, Timothy, the pastoral epistles that he wrote to Timothy and Titus, he's talking about believers. In fact, all the epistles, all the word of God is, is talking to believers. So it's believers that will depart from the faith. Because those out in the world are what? Are they in the faith? They may have a faith, but they're not in the faith. Jesus Christ crucified and risen again and ascended back to heaven and coming back to get his body. They don't believe that. So, there'll be some that will depart from that. And he's talking about the church. He's, he's talking to believers. Keep that in mind as we go through tonight's study. And if you have any questions, jump right in, because I'm going to go kind of like at Superman speed here, just to, to get this in tonight. But I don't want to leave any questions undone. So, this describes the time we live in now. I would say it absolutely does. Because we are seeing people fall away from the faith. Um, I've, I've said this uh, on numerous occasions, but after the Supreme Court legalized uh, homosexual marriage between two men and two women, I think that was a turning point. It was then I was shocked at how quickly the evangelical arm of the church, the one that has the most professing uh, born-again believers, had accepted that. I was astounded. People that I have known for 30 years that um, never uh, believed in that, never stood for that, didn't hate homosexuals. We, we can't hate people. They're sinners, just like anybody else. They need the love of Jesus Christ shed abroad in their hearts. They need to be born again. They need that radical encounter with Christ. Amen? Amen. But people accept that now. It's okay as long, and, and I heard that um, as long as they're monogamous, you know, that we're married, you know, and don't fool around. Well, that is just buying into the spirit of the age. You and I, those that believe the word of God, we are far from being in the majority. And I don't think the body of Christ has ever been in the majority, even from the inception of the church as a whole. But that being said, you will find your greatest attack is going to come from within the professing church, even more so than from outside the church. And it's already started. It has been going on. But we must ask this question. If this is really going on now, how will we know when it has reached its full bloom? 
other words, total apostasy. In other words, how much worse must things become before Paul's prophecy is fulfilled? So as we both, as we look at the term, a falling way, we'd agree that it describes the day in which we see a latter-day spiritual collapse. A few months after sending his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul had to send them a second one because it was, it was an update and a, clar and a clarification of his first epistle, which had carefully laid out, he had carefully laid out the doctrine of the rapture of the church. The reason he had to do that was it was in response to false teachers that had come behind Paul, and they were teaching that the day of Christ, which also is another uh, uh, term of day of the Lord, they were saying, we're already in the tribulation. Now, I want to say something right here. I got a uh, minister friend, in fact, he's my business partner with Covenant Craftsman Homes. He pastors in uh, uh, the Church of God in Jasper. Uh, Pete, I love you, but you know this church is better anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but he's got a lot of friends. Well, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say, but more than two. That are pastors in the Church of God that already believe we're in the tribulation. They don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. They already think we're in the tribulation. Now, if you just have read your Bible with an understanding that you don't allegorize it, but see, many of these ministers have been trained, even by our own denomination, being our own school of theology, that much of the Bible now is allegorical. You cannot come to that conclusion that we are in the tribulation if you are just even a baby in the Lord and you just take the word of God at face value when you read it. It's, it's not written for theologians. The word of God was written for you and me. Amen? Amen? It was written for every believer. You don't have to have a college degree to understand it. So this day the Lord will begin with seven horrific years of, of a catastrophe and judgment we know as the Great Tribulation. I, I skipped ahead. Let me go back to this real quick. These false teachers had entered congregations and had begun to point to the Roman persecutions of the Jews and Christians that the day of the Lord was already had arrived. Paul vigorously refuted this mistaken idea while declaring his original statement that the rapture would come before the day of the Lord. You see, this day of the Lord will begin with 70 horrific years of catastrophe and judgment that culminates in the battle of Armageddon and the second return of Christ, the second coming, where he lands on the Mount of Olives. Remember the rapture, he doesn't land on the Mount of Olives. He comes and meets us in the air. So that's not going to be visible to anybody but the church. Those that are born again, washed in the blood of Jesus. We're going to see that. We're going to hear it. We're going to experience that. It's going to be unlike anything we could ever, beyond your wildest imagination dreams, but it's going to be a reality. And that dream that I had from the Lord, that was the one thing. When I was going up, I said I was with, with unbelievable joy. I can't even describe it, but I would take one like this. I told you he was coming. I told you he was coming. Not in a kind of setting and say, see, I told you so. Not that way. Just with joy. Like, he finally came. Praise the Lord. And the thing that the Holy Spirit reviewed, revealed to me in that part of my dream several years later, you know how that was revealed over a four or five year period as we were driving up on Sunday morning service to, for me to preach. The Lord showed me five different aspects of that dream and five is interestingly the number of grace. All, all in that dream. But when he said that, the reason I was saying that was because in these last hours of these last days, I'm going to have to contend for that one biblical doctrine, unlike any other, and all the um, animosity, all of the contendings against people who profess to know the Lord, and even some that did, because they're attacking that. I've told you this on, on more than once, but there's ministries out now that out there now on the internet and intelligence that say if anybody that preaches the pre tribulation or after the rapture of the church is a false apostle or I mean a false teacher. So we're literally where Jesus said in the last days they'll call those that are good evil and those that are evil good. We're there. We're right here. So like Paul and his brethren, we too live in an increasingly insane and savage time. So the alarming rise of the anti-Christian sentiment in our society and the rest of the world is indicative of this. And the fact that Israel has been, uh, has been back in the promised land for 72 plus years, going on 73, also um, points to the soon return of Christ. Now, I believe, there's some believe and teach that when Jesus said in Matthew 24, and I won't talk a lot about this because I don't want to get through what we're talking about here, 
But he said, uh, his idea was, when Jesus said this generation, he meant a generation, meaning the characteristics of that generation. The only thing I have a problem with that is the characteristics of each generation. We've always had generations of uh, people in the church that were tares. But God is specific. And Israel became a nation in 1948. So I don't see this going out another 100 years, another 50 years, another 20 years, because of what we know what's going on in the science and the political, we can't go another 50 years. We can't go another 20 years. We can't go another 10 years before there may not even be in what we call humanity left. The science, the labs in science and in, in governments all over the world, I just heard three weeks ago in uh, China, uh, one of their labs, they created um, 150 chimeras that's half pig or pig and, and monkey mixed. Still looked like a pig, but had characteristics of a monkey, and they said they destroyed it. That, that the science is open. We are literally right now where Frankenstein could be created. Well, remember a few years ago, did I call you and I said, did you see that that Mio commercial, you know, the water flavor? Oh, yeah, that's been 10 years ago. 10 years ago, and it was, uh, it was like animal-human hybrids, and they were all sitting around at a table. This is like 10 years ago for we even, I was like, that is a weird marketing yeah. campaign for flavored water. Yeah. What am I, you I don't like, know the pretty name. blonde yeah. at the beach, yeah. like, hey, reverend, yeah. you know, that I can understand. I was like, I called that, I was like, I think we had just kind of gotten onto that. Yeah. I was like, that is just strange marketing to me. But, but we see all that going on around us. All the time. We're not dumb to it anymore. We see it. Um, there's been, you all know what GMO foods are. Well, they've been, we've been ingesting GMO foods for over 20 years now. At first, I didn't think it was no big deal because man has always had the ability to genetically um, modify corn because corn has got so many genes, it's unreal that you can, you can make it where it takes less water. But that's not what GMO is. When I really got into looking what GMO is, they're taking different genes from different species, not even in the plant kingdom and adding them to make the corn more resistant. Um, I know they've taken a gene from some insect that kills other insects. So when that insect is, is less likely to damage the corn. Well, we're ingesting all that, but where I'm going with this, Satan has always been out to remake all of God's creation, with man being the pinnacle of God's creation, remaking all of it, including man in his own image, which is always a distortion, a perversion of what God made. Before you move on, I just want to make the fact that I told you last night about the numbers. The the Bible is a mathematical book. Yeah. And it's so amazing when you just do a study on the math. It, it, it'll blow your mind. <laughs> and I'm not a math person. <laughs> but if you love math, oh my gosh, you'd just thrive on that. But anyway, uh, everything in the Bible, when he gives numbers, they're there for a reason. They're, they're specific. And they, are, they are not arbitrary. They are there for a reason. They mean something. And so when he says that about, uh, you know, when the nation of Israel and, and the fig tree and it came, you know, and, and, and When he said this generation shall not pass, I don't think he's referring just to characteristic. I think it's no, a time period because it can mean either or. But in context, I think it's a time specific, which a generation, allowing the Bible to interpret itself, it wasn't Israel's 40 years in the wilderness. That's not a generation. Mm -hmm. It wasn't 120 years, as some say, man's days are 120 years. But in the Hebrew, it says the man, God was given the man, Adam, 120 years to repent. Don't think he ever did because he's not listed in the Hall of Fame. I think if he and Eve had repented, they would have been listed there as a example, as the others are. Well, in Psalm 52, generation says... But a generation, 90, Psalm 90, verse 10... Is 70 to 80 years, three score and ten. If by chance a strong constitution, that means your body's a little able to defend and fight off aging better than someone else. You age, and interestingly enough, um, it's a high percentage like 96 97 percent of all people in the world, barring accidents, they naturally die between 70 and 80 years old. It's still that way in this country. Um, I just keep this in my Bible, and it's called God Counts, and it's uh, what the Hebrew, because every Hebrew letter has a is a number, so it's the same. It's the alphabet and the number. But 70 says punishment and restoration of Israel. Mm -hmm. That is interesting. 
So it's both punishment and restoration. Yes. Yeah. yeah, because think about what happens in the tribulation. God's judging and pouring out his wrath upon the world. But at the same time, he's restoring. At the same time, he's bringing Israel to where they'll cry out for the Messiah and restore them to the right place. Right. Because they literally have to hit. Per Look per at what the off. Feast of Trumpets is the um, judging of the trees. Well, nations are always referred to as trees. Even Israel is referred to as the fig tree. That's, not, that's the nations that are judged. What happened? What is Yom Kippur all about? The Great Day of Atonement. Thank you. When God restores and gives and, and brings life back to Israel, forgives them of their sins, and then the last great feast day of the seven feasts, the Feast of Tabernacles, which means what? God dwelling, there we are in the kingdom age, dwelling with men and forever he will dwell among men. We'll be able to see God the Father. He's not going to be this, you know, like uh, the Wizard of Oz. Or we go trembling, you know. And then, uh, you know, Jesus pulls back the curtain and says, there he is, there's the Father. And just interestingly, the number 40 is trials, probation, and testings. This is what they did in 40 years in the wilderness. So when you see numbers, look them up because yeah. they all mean something. And speaking of the last days, I don't know if y'all heard of this. NASA's been pretty quiet about it, but they've got a massive, massive comet. It's an asteroid. A, an asteroid. They named Wormwood. They yeah. coming to the I just heard on the news the other day one of their NASA's people. They've been kind of quiet about it, I think, because they don't want people to panic. But they said if it doesn't change course, it will be the biggest asteroid to ever hit the Earth. They said it's on course to hit within nine years. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that, and which, if you read Revelation, it's an asteroid that hits the Earth, which is called Wormwood. It poisons a third of the world. And that's what they named it. And um, the other thing we know we're not in the tribulation, even if we've been in the tribulation six months, we'd have a lot more dead people than just 100,000 roughly in this country. From mm -hmm. the, because in the first three and a half years, a third, one slash three, a third, that's 33.3% of 100, a third of all human beings will die within three and a half years. Right now, that's about 2.7 some point something billion. Um, do the math, 365 days in a year, how many people are dying? As if you averaged it out, it's got to be in the tens of thousands or more, or hundreds of thousands. I'll tell you in two seconds. You'll tell us in two seconds. And if you're interested in reading about that wormwood, we had read it, but Tom Horn, the Lord, woke him been, up yeah. in the middle of the night and said wormwood. And that we was had no idea what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was that asteroid, so he's written a book. Um, and you know where they're projecting it to hit? Off the coast of California. That's where that thing will hit. Now, also... <laughs> Also, they've been watching. Sorry, what, they've been watching. What, um, <laughs> scientists, uh, volcanologists have been watching and taking the measurements. They said something is going on in uh, uh, Yosemite. Yeah. Not Yosemite. Yo Yellowstone. 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 But also down the middle of the country, San Andreas Fault. But they said they don't believe it's good that Yellowstone's going to explode. What they think is the tectonic plates are getting ready to do a massive shift. Um, All right, you ready for how many people yeah. have per day? Yeah. So 2.7 billion people dying in three and a half years would be roughly 2.11 million people per day. Okay. Per day. Mm -hmm. In addition to people just die. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's on top of normal death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I cast my mind, he says we'll have birth pains. When you're getting ready to give birth, you've got birth pains. You know it's coming. Yeah. And the earth is experiencing birth pains. Know it's coming. Well, the Bible lets us know all creation is grown mm -hmm. for that day when the sons of God will be redeemed, meaning when we receive our glorified bodies. Because we're not even a fit extension. If God were to set the universe pristine right now, cast out all evil, we're still, even the best of us, even the most consecrated of believers, we're still in a broken earthly vessel. Right. We would screw it up somehow. Yeah. Amen. And at the same time, once we're redeemed, he's got to make the world a fit extension for us to live in because there can't be any vestige of sin. Mm -hmm. So yet Bible believing Christians are of, of our era have studied prophecy for decades and have been searching the scriptures under the conviction that through them the Lord will speak words of confidence, comfort, hope, 
in a world that is spinning out of control. And I'm going to tell you, anybody that's listening or watching, and those here, if you're not reading the Bible, you are throwing away the lifeboat. You are throwing away the only thing that God is sending by to get you ready to get out, get out of here. You need to read the Bible. You need to study systematically the scriptures. Do not jump around. I know that goes against the grain. But don't read uh, three, three chapters in the Old Testament and then Unless the Holy Spirit were to lead you to do that. But I have found out for 30 plus years of living for the Lord, let's see, longer than that, almost 40, because I'm, I don't know, 58. Yeah, I got saved at 40, uh, 20 years old, so that's 38 years ago. Yeah, almost 40. Uh, I know I don't know they they have been in my own eyes. Everybody will do right in some way. Yeah. I got, I got some, uh, the Wicked Witch's Mirror where it says, Mirror, mirror on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, see, I got to pull around. I'll read the word. It's systematically read. Get in one book, and or or take a topic and go through. Like, um, when I want to start, I'm gonna start preaching a series on what it means to be in Christ. Find out, find all the references that mean in God, with God, in Christ. From the Old Testament all the way through to the New Testament. From the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. Now that's a good systematic Bible study. You're not in one book, but you're studying the concept, which is more than a concept. The reality of who we are and what that means to be in Christ. Because until a believer, until a person that is born again, really starts to comprehend. And listen, I don't fully understand it or have all that meaning and all that there can be mined out of that. But until a person understands who they are in Christ, they are, are deaf of the knowledge of just what that means and how that can play out to their victorious lifestyle, to their power for witnessing for God, to their, uh, for their uh, the anointing just to reach out with the gospel and change lives. Until you understand who you are in Christ, you're not really fighting the enemy much. You're not much of a threat. I'm not saying you're not saved. If you're in Christ, you're saved. But we are so shortchanged because we do not understand what that means. So, stay tuned. That's coming to a church near you. <laughs> That's going to be Sunday series of messages. But as in Paul's day, there is now an increasing undercurrent of false teaching in which some preachers <laughs> teach and teachers are telling that the day of the Lord will come while Christians are on earth. And so uh, beat some of Pete's friends. And he's not the only one. I've heard that from others. I've heard it even talked on the radio and, and the television that uh, some believe we're in the tribulation right now. Just clarify, Pete doesn't believe that. No, Pete does not believe that. <coughs> Stick it up for Pete. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and Pete's very thankful because he's got someone similar to the Apostle Paul, and he's like Timothy, and I'm like the Apostle Paul. <laughs> If Pete's watching right now, he's probably fixing that. Anyways, uh, many present what they see as evidence of this fact that we're in the we're in the tribulation. Uh, I mean, some are going to this that they believe this coronavirus is, is one of the plagues of the tribulation. Well, not, not even close. Not, I was going to say not even. But even then, we don't have to use that as a memory stick. I can tell you why we're not in the tribulation. Because all of us, and many of you that are on watching, that are born again of believers, washing the blood of Christ, we're still here. And then, of course, those that think we're in the kingdom age, if this is the kingdom age, I am so, so, so yeah. we, we got ripped. <laughs> yeah. No joke. You say, Jesus, what happened? Yes. What the, what, what the prophets and the apostles wrote doesn't add up here. But we know that's not the case. Amen? Amen. So, we see the same problem of interpretation that delayed the early Christians is alive and well in our, that in our day in the church. So those of us who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture also live in the moment-by-moment moment expectation that our blessed hope will be realized in our lifetimes. Now, as I... And I don't know if it's because I think part of it is we get older, we look for the return of the Lord, we got more aches, more pains, and we're just tired of it. But this is beyond that. 
I have, in the last eight or nine years, probably really since I came here in 2009, but even more so in the last three or four years, I literally am longing to see the rising tide of evil judged. I don't take pleasure in people being judged because when God judges and his wrath is poured out, that's it. There's no coming back from that. Only a fiery indignation is what lies ahead. But I think every believer, and I talked to a great friend of mine who's my best friend, um, who was, I was also his associate pastor, and I'll tell you who it was, you know, it was Bill Flynn. Um, he said one time that we were just, uh, what he gave me a card, he said we were one stranger, now we're just strange friends, something like that. <laughs> and, uh, but anyways, it is so true, he feels, he feels the same way. We're just tired of seeing evil win. I'm sick of it. But the whole world has no attraction for me anymore. That's those tethering lines I believe God is cutting. Because when he when he started revealing these, and literally the Holy Spirit said, I'm cutting you loose from the things of this world. I was I'm not talking about sinful desires and pleasures. I was like, we used to love to watch football. You, me, and Robbie. Yeah. Then the older we got, I just like this just has well, no that's where I learned it. I just I just lost interest because you know what? I see so much the world in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's no different than the world now. It's played out the same way. It used to be a game that had honor and, and had life lessons in it. The old coaches from the golden era of football couldn't even coach today. No, no. And I, I would say they wouldn't even want to coach today. Okay. But that it's just that when the Lord showed me I'm cutting those tethers. Because it's like a hot air balloon. What keeps it on the ground is those tether lines. But once they're let loose, does the hot air balloon just kind of go over here? You go, no, he should straight shoot up. straight up. And I believe God is getting ready every member of the body of Christ to get out of here. I think if you were to look at your own eyes, you're starting to sit. And well, I can tell you from firsthand, uh, what was bothering me over the weekend was I was thinking, wow, I'm 34. I'll be 35. Just thinking about John. He's going to be 40. Thanks, Jeff. And then I started thinking about all my friends that are lost. And I can't, I had talked to them. One today told me he just didn't want to hear it. Got real ugly with me. I had to walk in five miles. That's another story. Today, that was a long story. 50 pounds of climbing here. I actually tried to hitchhike. But then he put the bike. So anyway, but I was just thinking, the older I get, the more I want to see my friends in heaven with me, and I could just care less about sports and buying this car, buying a car, and I'm, John and I were talking about this, I was like, man, they're going to miss it. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, you know, and I, I'm going to tell you, those that have been playing around, that maybe once knew the Lord and they've gotten careless and they've literally walked away and they're, they're just relying on yesterday, and I mean maybe 20, 30 years ago, man, that's why you got to be in this. This is fresh man every day. I can't live on my experience from even yesterday with the Lord. I got to have it fresh. You got to have it fresh every day. That being said, don't stop talking to your friends about the Lord because still Lord can. Oh no, no, you, absolutely. You keep talking about and it, it. And it did. It really bothered me thinking that my uh, my brother that's four years older than me uh, is working with my oldest brother, and he talked to him, and and uh, he said, Bobby, don't don't you believe in Jesus Christ? Don't you need to get get uh, right with Him? You need in your heart. And he said, well, I believe in historical Jesus. And, and Ken said, well, that, that's not enough. He is God, and he died to save you. But he doesn't want to hear it. And I'm afraid he may be one of those that is given over a strong delusion because he's rejected the lie. And I remember he got close to being saved about 15, 16 years, 16 years ago when he got a divorce. He was reading uh, Les Strobel. Is it Les Strobel's book? Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel. Lee. Lee Strobel. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, anyways, he got close, but he just never would give his heart. But now it's, you know, maybe eight things up. But at the same time, Kenny's great. When you told me, you called me and said, you're not going to believe this. So what happened? You said, Kenny got sad. I said, yeah. Uncle Kenny? <laughs> they were there and said it. And then I was, and I, I actually was a little convicted because mm -hmm. sometimes you just want to be like, well, let them go to hell. And if that's where they want to go, but. But you're right, as we get close to the Lord, just keep family members, that's on our heart. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I, I don't want to stay here for one more minute. Then we have to. Yeah. Really no, I'm, I'm just grieved. Yeah, that's what I'm grieved for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I was, about 
laying in bed Saturday night, and I was thinking about that, or why the Holy Spirit brought that to my mind, but I was thinking, you know, the Bible says that each man was judged according, it says, and the books were open, not just the book, that's the Lamb's Book of Life. So he'll open the books right there on April 20th, 2020, James was climbing a tree, told you about me, you rejected it. And I was thinking about that, I was like, and knowing you chose to go there, it was a terrible thought. So the older I've gotten, the more I want to see. Like I told Avery the other day, I said, man, I want you to be in heaven with me. He just didn't even say anything. Yeah. So it was like, well, yeah, I can and, and I think that's going to be, I think we'll be, this is just my thoughts, but I think we'll be in that mezzanine. Uh, mezzanine. Mezzanine. Is that how you pronounce it? Mezzanine. 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 Like this, I can't hardly. <laughs> mezzanine. Mezzanine. Anyway, <laughs> we're going to be there, I think, because All when the Lord calls this person, they say, nobody told me this day. They'll, they'll go right to that person and say, stand up, and we'll be called as a witness. But it'll be a witness against them, I not for them. But we won't think about that. We'll have the mind of Christ. Remember, like Jesus is the only one that can judge righteously exactly. without any qualm of not being righteous. He's the only one. He's the perfect righteous judge. So let's move on here because I don't want to get sidetracked too much. But we know that this can happen, what? I'm talking about the rapture at any moment because no prophecy has to be fulfilled before the rapture. So this is the doctrine of imminency as taught with great clarity by the Apostle Paul. For he believed it and taught it and taught the churches of, of, uh, his, day to, uh, of his day to live in the light of this blessed hope. And just like we are, just like I'm doing right now. Live in that. When you have in mind that the rapture can happen today, there's times I get up on the morning and say, Lord, is this the day you're coming back? Mm -hmm. I do. I bet some of you do the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's not every day I think that. But it's seldom I go too many days without thinking that. Or I may think it in the afternoon. We come back while I'm sleeping. He's, hey, you and me sound asleep having a great dream. You're going to hear it when the Lord says, come up. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting what the Lord told me about your dream because I remember you were talking to Rodney and he said, I don't understand why I didn't hear the trumpet. That was the last thing he showed me. And that was something I asked. And the Lord told you, said, if you heard the trumpet, if I would have asked, it would have been the real We've all been gone. You heard, or heard his voice. I, I wouldn't have been a shadow of what's to come. It would have been the event right then and there. Hey, can I say something? Yeah. About those numbers again. I don't believe that, uh, you know, if, oh, we all repent and everything, that we'll, we'll keep him from coming. No, he's no. on a timeline. He's on a timeline. You know, and he says a thousand years is as a day, and a day is a thousand years, and we're nearing the end of 6,000 years. Yeah. And the Hebrew calendar, they're, they're not quite sure, because after the uh, diaspora, they got the calendar off. So they're not exactly sure about their own calendar. But I know that it's 200-something years, according to them, from 6,000. So the the millennial reign is a thousand years. So we have to get we've got it's all got to be wrapped up on the sixth day to rest on the seventh day. Yeah. You see and there again how those numbers are so. And we're not going a couple hundred more years. There'd be no, no flesh left alive. No. So I believe they're doing the, the human genome right. now with the technologies there that uh, you can even change your physical appearance um, by getting genes spliced into you right now. Mm -hmm. And DARPA has been doing that for who knows how long. They're creating super soldiers. Well, CRISPR now is on the market. I yeah. just heard something about that uh, the other day. Uh, it was on mainstream news they were talking about the CRISPR DNA. The interesting thing is, I heard a gen geneticist talking about this. Uh, no, it was Billy Crone uh, quoting uh, one of the geneticists in his latest film. He's got three or four or five or six of the top in that field right now and that are for this, but even they said this. When you edit a gene out, because it's going to be up like the idea if you got a, a gene for breast cancer, they can go in there and take it out. But what they don't tell you is by removing that gene, yes, you've removed the cancer gene, but you've also removed 13 other things that gene did that now will never be done in your body, will never be replicated. So you don't have any idea of what the ramifications of that are. And I think that we got, uh, uh, we go to scripture and see where that that there would be ramifications because those who take the mark of the beast, for a while they just, they seek death, but they cannot die. I think they've had an upgrade in their body somehow, 
It makes it harder to die. But look at all the stuff that happens to them. The, these boils come all over their body. I think that's science going away, as well as they've sealed their fate because they've been changed genetically. They're no longer fully human, and they won't even desire to be saved because now they have the nature of their power. Same. Same. Scary stuff, isn't it? Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17. It says this. For the Lord himself, notice in Revelation, it's talking about an angel, but the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout. I was referring in Revelation, I think it's chapter there 13. Is no to the, chapter 4. Huh? There is no chapter 4. Yeah, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Oh, I'm going to say that. I'm sorry. It's the one I'm It's the one with a one on it. Yeah. For the, chapter 4, what? 16, verse 14, 16, and 17. I mean, chapter 4, verse 16, and 17. Okay. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Notice this is the trump of God in Revelation chapter 13. There's those that say at the end of the uh, trumpet judgments is when the church is called out, but it's a different person blowing a trumpet, and that's the time of judgment. The the uh, scrolls, the trumpets, and the vials is all God's wrath. We're not appointed to wrath. But then it says in verse 17 that when then which then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord of the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Paul then followed up with an unequivocal statement that Christians will not experience God's coming judgment. For the world systems and its inhabitants. For God, in verse 19 there, in 1 Thessalonians 5 9, excuse me, 5 9 says, For God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And the opponents of the pre tribulation rapture will say something that's analogous to this um, it's not fair, or uh, uh, the devil, um, uh, God's got to use wrath. I heard this. Uh, God's got to put the church through some judgment to purify the church. And I say to them, when you want, don't understand what happened at Calvary then. Because Jesus Christ took and purified us by what he did by offering his life up as a sacrifice and shedding his blood. That's what purifies the church. No amount of us doing penance of any type brings purity to us. It's only our faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. And the fact that he's risen again, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. In fact, in Philippians it says, I am... And every other believer is seated where? Oh, that's one of those. See, mm -hmm. study that. What it means to be in Christ. In Christ. That's powerful. Because you know what that means? Jesus being seated means his priestly work was a one and done. One and done. That's why the city says, my work is done. If you notice when you study the Old Testament tabernacle and then the temple, there was never a chair for any of the priests to sit in, because their work was never done. But Christ, one time, took the wrath of God, and then it was finished. So you and I, by being in Christ, we are to rest in his finished work, rest in his provision, rest in that he will see us through to the end. But it also means something else, meaning he is not seated at the right hand of the Father as the second Adam, fully man, fully God. But he has received all power and authority as the second Adam, as the man who did what the first Adam failed to do. By us being in Christ means we also, and it fits right up with Scripture, Jesus said, I give you all authority over scorpions, over the devil, over the devils, and, and everything like that. Us being in Christ not only means we rest in him, but we have and share in that authority. Not as a little God, you will never be even a little G God. What you are uh, is ambassadors for Christ. See, when we, when we fail to understand it, we, we just, we walk around being too much afflicted and defeated of the enemy instead of pushing back the enemies of God. So let's go on. In 2 Thessalonians chapter um, 2, verses 1 through 3, it then again says, I now beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, boom, that's the rapture, that ye be not soon shaken, and that means to topple or destroy. So in other words, don't let your mind, don't let your faith be toppled, don't let it be destroyed. 
Do not let your mind soon be shaken or troubled neither by spirit. Remember Paul writing to Timothy? There'll be those that will listen to doctrines of devils and seducing spirits. Or by word, people twisting the word, taking it out of context, or writing something that they said is a vision or whatever, but it doesn't line up with scriptures. Nor by letter, because some of them were writing letters after Paul left. As from us, but forging Paul's name on it. As the day of Christ is at hand, let no man, what's that say? No man. No man. Does that just mean a guy that looks like he's a devil? Mm -hmm. Does that mean just the uneducated? But it can be any man, even the most educated, even the one that's got uh, all kinds of doctorates and PhDs and who's went to what was so-called the best seminaries. Let no man deceive you by any means. Let me ask you something. Is lying signs and wonders a means by which people will be led astray? No. We just had the whole uh, shucksters with the, with the Bible up going around. The whole United States. Do you think people were deceived by that? Mm -hmm. Every one of them were deceived that were buying into that. But now what's happened when they were found out they were charlatans? Their faith. Probably have been shaken in their faith. Probably have been shaken in their faith. I, and, and pastors in our own denomination that had them at their churches and had them on their YouTube channel and everything. What must they think now? I could name some of them, but I won't. But what must they be thinking? I feel like idiots. Yeah. yeah. They've been done. That's because they yeah. did not take what they were saying, what they were presenting to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, I can't stress this enough. It doesn't matter if I'm preaching. If it cannot be validated by the scriptures, then it's not that I got some or somebody else has got a new revelation from God. It means that we are listening to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils. This is the litmus test, the word of God. If it can't pass that, then don't accept it. In fact, reject it outright. Verbally, however you got to do, reject it. All in the spirit of love, but reject fallacy, falsehood, deceit, lies, deception. Yes. Example of what we're going through today. Um, I, when all this coronavirus started, probably you know a couple weeks into it, I was sitting outside and reading my Bible, and I said, "Lord, just what is going on?" And I said, "Lord, talk to me about this coronavirus." And I heard just as clear as a bell my promises. Well, that's not really what I wanted to hear. You know, I was sort of disappointed. You know, <laughs> and, and then as the weeks have gone on. That, that keeps coming back to me, my promises, my promises. And, I, and now I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what a more perfect word could he have given me? You know, my promises. So for every single thing that we're faced, whether it's financial or, or medical or whatever, he's saying go to my promises. Mm -hmm. And I can rely on his promises. And, and the reason I bring this up is because every time I turn the news on, and I've gotten where I'm watching Newsmax instead of Fox News, but anyway, they're saying something different. One doctor says to wear a mask. One doctor says it's 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 bad for you to wear a mask. One doctor says this. One doctor says that. Oh, that's what's so funny is Dr. Fauci himself said at the very beginning of all this that people weren't supposed to rush out and buy masks because masks did no good. Right. And now they're saying if you go outside, you got to wear a mask. It's well, he's the same one that told people that you go hook up and have sex. Yeah. And yeah. yet I can't get within six feet right. of you shake your hand. So my, yeah. my point is, we can't believe a word they're saying. Okay? And then they tell us that that, that medicine uh, doesn't do any good and the FDA is saying don't take it, but then Trump and all his team is taking it. You, and you, you got know, people in Europe taking it. And it's, exactly. So what I'm saying is, it's all lies and it's all verbiage. Mm -hmm. You know what? We need to go to this and we need to say, God, speak to me about Corona. Speak to me what I need to do. It just you know? busy. And, and I thought, you know, I'm here and I, well, we're praying about it. You know, okay, fine. If you're praying about it, I prayed about it and the Lord told me to go to his promises. The Lord told me to go to his word. Mm -hmm. The Lord told me to stand on what his word says. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I'm saying? So instead of, we need to go to God mm -hmm. and find out what God says. And say, Lord, show me in your word. Speak to me. Show me what I need to do. And not buy into all this garbage. Yeah. And it shows you the, where we are. This has been a dry run to see how fast they could, how they could subdue mm -hmm. the peoples of the world, especially in this country. And we went right to where we we're supposed to. Yeah. Now, the first couple weeks, I could understand that because nobody really knew what we were dealing with, but except probably a select few. 
But now, as it's moved on into months, I know what the end game is. The end game is to bring about a one world government because they're always talking about a worldwide inoculation yeah. that will plant a little chip. And guess where they want to? Guess where they want to put it in? Mm -hmm. My your right hand. hand. Your right hand mm -hmm. or your forehead. You heard that? Oh yeah. Oh, Bill Gates mm -hmm. has been talking. Yeah. About oh, really? Uh, yeah. 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 He didn't I've use the word too. mandatory. But he said that the only way we're going to be able to get around this is if everyone in the world receives. Yeah. How they would do it. How, how, how will they do it? Now, yeah, oh, you can't open your business unless you've been inoculated. Exactly. Can't come to this grocery store. Exactly. Can't buy it or sell. Right. And they want to do it by the military. And I heard on Fox News that day, they were, they were praising that one of those doctors that's on there all the time. Oh, this is wonderful. And I'm like, why in the world do we need to get the military involved with, for inoculation? Because they're going to force yeah, it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. now, I mean, the, the, the logical yeah. Come on, people. would be logistics. Just the logistics. You know, with drug stores and doctor's offices and hospitals, just like the flu shot. You go anywhere and get a flu shot. They yeah. set up trailers to give you a flu yes. shot. We don't need the military. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so I've also heard, you know, that they're they're starting to put the chip in, you know, for you to buy. And I think it's over in Sweden or something. Yeah, it was in Sweden. We're already doing that at yeah. this point. But um, so... That wouldn't be the mark of the beast, though, right? At this point. I know. No, no, and I'll tell, you, I, I tell you, where I was going to say something, this can't be in, implemented until the church is gone yeah. because we have authority over that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Too many people, or too many people saying, hey, even people that don't want the word of God, suddenly they're going to hear some, one of these Christian people say, hey, this is what it says in Revelation. You know what? Bibles are still ubiquitous. They are everywhere. Mm -hmm. And people are getting to go, hey, wait a second. Mm -hmm. This is funny. This is written. Thousands of years ago, a couple thousand, and now so you take this mark in your hand and your yeah, maybe there's something to this. So even a even a person who's not a believer, they don't want that as a whole right now. But once the church is gone, I thought about this today. When the rapture happens, can you you can't even imagine the pandemonium and the panic and the sheer terror that's going to grip the world? Oh yeah, limousines mm -hmm. crashing, car crashes everywhere. No, mm -hmm. well I think they. I think they're going to have an alien agenda somehow that will just, that will explain why we're suddenly gone. Now, keep in mind, I heard a pastor, and it wasn't Earl Falk who died lost, even as kids were pleading with him to repent, and he said he had nothing to repent for. Mm. Thanks. And he had once been a big, bright, shining star in the Church of God, and then he was disfellowshipped because he wouldn't quit messing around with women other than his wife. Um... But it wasn't him, but it was someone else. And this was back in the early 90s. As I was prone to do back then, I would have, you know, preachers on, or I'd get you while we're getting ready, getting dressed, getting ready, and getting the boys ready to go to church. And I was just going through the channels, but I called a number and said, now let me explain the rapture. I thought, hmm, I gotta go back to that. And I got right back to the channel, and he said this. He said, now the rapture is really gonna happen. He said, it's God in his mercy. I'm almost verbatim what he said. Getting those that are in the way of what God wants to do on this earth out of the way. Oh, so oh, that yeah. the rest of us can do, and he had to be a kingdom, not be a logan. So the rest of us can fulfill what God's wanting to do in these last, I can not remember said last days, but in this oh, present time. Goodness. And I, I would holler at her and I said, oh my dear God, they're... He's training people to receive the Antichrist. Hmm. Because if you're not saved, you're going to be left here. And you, you, I don't even have to name these big television ministries. And they, what they preach is another gospel. And people will be so terrified that when church leaders get, and it will happen, so no, this is what this means, this means... And the leaders of the world will come together and they'll coalesce around one man that has all the answers. Hmm. And because they refuse to believe the truth, God gives them over to delusions strong to believe a lot. Strong delusions, says. Hmm. Not that God says, I'm choosing you. I'm, I'm going to make you, or you will never believe to go to hell. What that, when you rightly divide the word of God and you look at it, what it means, it great means that he's given them their desire. See, God will never violate your will or mine. 
And if they say love and peace, yeah. You know, that's all it's going to take. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially if it comes from the church or now, now whatever church that is. Let's you know. say the rapture happens the next three or four days. The rapture is not the beginning. Remember this. The rapture is not the beginning of the tribulation. It is the confirming of the beast treaty with Israel. Boom. The moment that's confirmed, that's when that time clock is set. From that moment, seven years to that exact minute, Christ comes back. On the Mount of Olives. So, from the moment the people, in other words, if the Lord were to come back, I mean, yeah, if Jesus were to come back right now, maybe Sunday, wouldn't that be great? You mean the rapture? You mean the rapture? The rapture. Okay. For the church. Okay. Doesn't mean there, there will probably be several months until everything's somewhat calmed down and there won't be natural disasters happening yet. That's key. And then this guy will have all the answers and people will maybe for a period of might be three months, could be almost a year, where it looks like, man, we're in our utopia. This is great. But the moment the Antichrist confirms the treaty with Israel, that starts the clock. From then on, God you will show you. Count countdown clock on your wall and watch it and wait for the And here come the judgments. Immediately, the seals are open. First seal is open. And once you progress from there, you go to the trumpet judgments. Once you progress from the trumpet judgments, and each series of judgments gets worse. And so by the time you get to the end of the vile judgments, at the Battle of Armageddon, where the Antichrist has gathered all the armies of the world to fight against, he was coming back on the white horse. Hmm, who's that? Jesus. That's right. It's Jesus. And think about it. There won't just be 2.77 billion dead by the end of that seven years. It could very well be maybe most of the population. I mean, you could only have a billion people left. You may have another billion or another two billion already died before he finally hits the mountain of dollars. So are there people that will be saved during that time? I mean, yeah. I know there's 144,000, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean 144,000 is the Jewish that's evangelists. 12,000 out of each tribe. They they're going out of there, over there. They're going to witness to the whole world. Go so witness to the whole world. The whole, yeah. so and then there's a particular the rapture for them right in the middle of, yeah. of the tribulation. Yeah. For them. For yeah. the 144,000, yeah. yes. Okay. Because they can't even be harmed or hurt. But, but then there might be people that are still going to say. But there's people that will get saved. Yeah, they're the yes, martyrs. they're the martyrs. And they're they're the two, martyrs. you have the two witnesses. Yeah, yeah. That at, yeah, at the middle of tribulation. And they're preaching the gospel. They are killed, but in three days. Yeah, the Bible says their bodies literally lie dead in the streets for three days. And then, and then they, they get up, they get up. up. And then the Bible says that's when fear comes into the kings and the heart, the yeah. hearts of the kings of the earth. Because they're like, oh man. All right, so. I'll move along here. And Paul here acknowledges that some of his contemporaries believed in the day of, believed that the day of the Lord, here called the day of Christ, had already arrived. All because of false prophecy, mistaken preaching, uh, forged letters, and some had uh, become convinced that God's wrath had already begun to be poured out on the world. So at the time of 2 Thessalonians was written, it was looking like it might be the time of the end. The reign of the Emperor Claudius was, was near its end. And uh, mark the debauchery, marked by debauchery, political deceit, and finally the assassination brought Nero to power. And interesting enough, it was uh, Claudius' wife who uh, murdered, with the help of Nero, um, Claudius, so her son Nero could come to power. power. And then again, Claudius uh, had appointed Herod Agrippa, uh, known as the Dark King, who was married to his own sister, Bernice. He was over the kingdom of, of Israel. And he controlled the politics and the corrupt priesthood in Jerusalem. So looking at all these events, it would have been easy to conclude that they, uh, the vaunted stability of the Roman government was rapidly disappearing, which it was. Yet with all this upheaval taking place, Paul still assured the early church that the event that he called the falling away had yet to happen. This term is a translation of the Greek apostasia and generally regarded as a signifying apostasy from not just faith, the faith. The definite article is the faith. But in its literal meaning, it also means departure. So we know with a historical certainty that this falling away didn't happen throughout the first century. Um, 
This time frame marked the beginning and the building of the church, not its demise. We know that because history bears that out. We're a part of that as of today. And then finally, again, there's those that say in AD 135, talk about Hadrian, um, who presided over the defeat of the Jewish uh, resistance, and he set up a statue of Jupiter in what then was kind of remake of the Holy Holies. The temple it wasn't really a temple like it had been rebuilt. It was a, just a shadow of what it was, just so they, they tried to still have the animal sacrifices. But if you look at that, there's been a lot worse times since AD 135. So that wasn't the time when the Antichrist is going to go into the Holy of Holies and set his statue up and declare himself and be seated as if he's God, and he declares himself God. And we know that's going to happen. But during all these events, the falling away hadn't occurred. Now, how do we know this? Because Paul wrote that when it comes, that when it came, it would introduce a series of events. First, the man of sin would be revealed to perform the act of standing up in the Holy of Holies of the Jewish temple, claiming to be God. For in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible declares, who openeth and exalteth himself, who opposeth, excuse me, and exalteth himself above all that is called God or is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself to, that he is God. So after then, AD 135, Hadrian placed the pagan statue, and I just said that. Got to add myself, but we're back on track. But then there is a test. I'm getting ready to bring this to a close. As Paul, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, penned 2 Thessalonians, he gave believers there and the faithful of our day a test scenario. It is a specific set of instructions for the purpose of determining whether or not the day of the Lord had come. Knowing this then, no believer would, would ever again be able to teach that the tribulation had already begun. On the other hand, a non-believers, being in the period being in the period following the rapture, will be able to use Paul's letter to affirm that the day of the Lord had begun. Some ask the question then, does the term falling away apply to the society at large or just the church? I think that applies to the church. The answer is simply this. Those outside the church, the unredeemed, are already in a fallen state. Is Paul warning, so Paul's warning that before the day of the Lord, many will depart from the faith, that is Jesus Christ crucified and risen and ascended again, and faith in that finished work he did on the cross, and faith in that alone. And then he talks about the departure. So however, from the prophecy of the seven churches in Revelation, it is well known that the church age will conclude in faithlessness and growing apostasy. The first of the churches, remember when we studied the church is Ephesus, is the church characterized by apostolic zeal as the gospel's carriage of unbelieving world in the first century after Christ. The last church age, or the last church in, in Revelation, or Laodicea, has fallen from the faith and is in danger of being rejected, Revelation chapter 3, 14 through 17. If you got that, move to there real quick and we'll read those scriptures. Revelation chapter 3. 14 and 7. And under the angel of the church of Laodicea, that means the pastor, messenger, angel here means messenger, pastor, right, these things say it, and I love this, the amen. Remember, amen means the truth. The truth is a person, Jesus Christ. The faithful and true witness, nobody more faithful, no more true witness than Jesus Christ himself. The beginning of the creation of God. I know that works. Remember, this is Jesus talking to this church, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Meaning they don't have the righteousness of God. Now, this is the same as being rejected from the body, the body of Christ. In other words, this church is compromised, or is comprised, excuse me, they are compromised, so, comprised of unsaved people posing as devout believers. They have wealth, 
social power, beautiful buildings, and mutual business connections, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. So the idea is uh, reinforced by the closing words of the Lord to the church, Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open, Sorry. The door, I will come into him, and I will sup with him, and he with me. There again, notice, I will come into him in Christ. The born again experience. Bring this all to a close. I can do it in less than five minutes, you believe? <laughs> <laughs> the door opens. In Revelation 4 1, John saw this. He said, After this, I look, after what? After these seven churches, these letters to these seven churches, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet. Mm. Where do we hear that again? It's Thessalonians, first Thessalonians, talking with me, which said, Come up hither. You know, this could be Jesus as a southerner. <laughs> And I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a, <clears throat> a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So here we have an affirmation of Paul's own description of events that will surround the rapture of the church. The falling away, that's the letters to the seven churches. The falling away which Paul describes at the, is, is as the delineating delineating marker for the beginning of the day of the Lord is identifiable as the time when the majority of the professing church lapses into apostasy. And much of the organized church will remain here after this event, the rapture. But it will be an apostate church that welcomes the social and governmental changes we regard as horrifying as believers. And most of all, they will welcome the Antichrist as Savior of the world. But in 2 Thessalonians, look at verse 2, 6 through 8. And I will close it with this. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he, notice the male pronoun there, who now let it, will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The he there, um, a lot of commentators say it's the Holy Spirit that's removed. But I'm with, a, I believe it's a growing number, and I come to the conclusion on this on my own. I don't believe it's the Holy Spirit, per se. It's the body of Christ. Because the Holy Spirit will still be here in a different capacity during the tribulation. But he's still drawing men to Christ. And there's angels flying through the heavens, just like at the treetops it says. Saying, don't take the mark of the beast. If you do, doom. It's over. Lake of fire is your eternal destination. So, we're known as the body of Christ. And it's interesting, nowhere... Does the Bible declare that the body of Christ is the bride of Christ? Now, it doesn't ever say that, nowhere in the scriptures does it ever specifically say the, the body of Christ is the bride of Christ. In fact, in Revelation, the, the bride of, uh, of Christ is the new Jerusalem that comes down. With that being said, when we look at the unity between a man and a woman, they become one flesh. In that respect, we would be one with Jerusalem. As far as spiritual Jerusalem goes, there's the body of Christ. There's that. Uh, new man being made out of the, the Jew and the Gentile. But it, it's fitting that it's the church that has been given power right now by Jesus as a mandate that we can tread on scorpions, we can resist the enemy, we can push back the kingdom of darkness. But once the church is gone, there's no restraint on evil. So if you think it's bad now, you cannot imagine what it's going to be like when the restraining power, the dam, so to speak, that's holding back the rising torrent and, the, and just the unbelievable flood of evil in every aspect. 
what that's going to be like when we're removed. Horrifying. It is horrifying. Mm -hmm. But we are not appointed, and I'll end with this, to wrath. <laughs> We've always suffered the wrath of the enemy. But Jesus said, don't fear him, we can only destroy the body. The body, uh, the body. Fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Mm -hmm. So we've always been and, and had to I'm talk about the church and humanity in general, but the church specifically has always had to put up and fight against and endure the wrath of Satan. But because you've been washed in the blood, Jesus took those stripes to heal your body, but he also had the wrath of God smit him to cleanse you of your sin and pay the penalty that was due on each and every one of us. And you can go right to Exodus and look at it. That's why Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land because the first time God told him to smite the rock, the rock in Exodus represented what? Who was better? But it represented Jesus Christ. And it's interesting when, when uh, uh, Moses smote the rock that represented Christ. What came out of that rock? A river of water. And one little stream, because a stream could not have water and gave uh, maybe three million people enough to drink it, millions of, uh, and, and the livestock that goes with them. Maybe up to a million head of sheep and cattle went out of work. No, there's a, been a good book, uh, I mean, a good uh, documentary. Um, I can't remember his name, but if you go to the Prophecy Watchers, you can get it. And the guy's done uh, some great research. He found the rock in Saudi Arabia. And when you look at it from the air, from satellite, you can see where a river, a half a mile wide or wider, starts right where this rock, and this rock is cleaved perfectly in half. But Moses did something that was contradictory to the word of God. The second time they needed water, on a second occasion, God said, speak to the rock. That's the word of God speaking to us. And Moses, in his anger, smote it. And God said, you will not enter the promised land because he would not let that stand. In other words, you go to Hebrews, Jesus Christ was smitten and took the wrath of God once. And God accepted that as payment in the heavenly court of justice. So for the body of Christ to go to through any part of the tribulation is antithetical to what the scriptures teach. My penalty the wrath of God that was due to fall on me and each and every human being, those of us that are in Christ accepted him, it fell on Jesus. So for the church to go through any part of the revelation would be God the Father saying, Jesus, you just did not do enough. And that is blasphemy, in my opinion. We'll close with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time. We give you all the glory and honor and then just magnify your precious name. Lord, just give us, each one of us not only a desire, but a boldness in these last hours, these last days, in love to proclaim Jesus Christ to all our friends, neighbors, anyone that the Holy Spirit brings to us. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit bring those who are searching and want to know the truth. And Father, we ask this in Christ's name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. There we go. Praise the Lord. <laughs>